Okay, so we know that we're going to be talking about uh, linear equations, and I mentioned that linear equations are like equations for lines and planes uh, in that they have terms that are a single variable times a coefficient or there's simply a con constant term. All right. So we're going to talk about solving such systems of linear equations. System means there's more than one and by solving, as he says here, is we want to find the possible values of the variables in those equations. Now, it's not always true that there's exactly one value for each variable. There might be more than one possibility. Or there might be no solutions whatsoever. So we'll see uh, examples of all of those things. Now, by contrast, let's look at a ca case where we have nonlinear equations. Here are two equations, x squared plus y squared equal 1 and minus x plus square root of 3y equal to 0. Now you can check the solution by substitution. In, in cases like this, often a graphical approach is very useful. Now that's possible when you have few variables. It's not possible when you have many variables. So let's see what this looks like graphically. Okay. I've copied the equations here. x squared plus y squared equals 1 minus x plus square root of 3y equal to 0. It's good to try to graph this set of uh, the, these two equations. Well, let's make a x and y axes here. Okay, and this is my x axis, my y axis. Okay, x squared plus y squared plus 1, hopefully you remember from some, somewhere that this is the equation of a circle of radius 1. Okay. You can see, for example, that when x equal 1, y equals 0. When x equal minus 1, y equals 0. When x equals 0, y equals 1. When x equals 0, y equals minus 1 also works. So we have those four points work. And in fact, any point on the circle centered at the origin is a point on this. On this. So this gives us this uh, circle here. Now this is going to be a line. Uh, we can think of this uh, solve, solving for y, we'll get y equal to uh, x over square root of 3. Okay. If you think about intercepts and stuff like that, uh, when x equals 0, y is equal to 0. This actually has slope 1 over square root of 3. So it's going to be, if I was going to draw that line, in a different color. It would have slope 1 over square root of 3. 1 over square root of 3 is less than 1, so it's going to look something like this. And we can see there's going to be two intersections between this line and this circle. Now these intersections represent solutions. Because these points are on both the circle and on the line. So if I get the if I find the x and y coordinates for these two points and plug them into the circle, they should work. And if I plug them into the line, they should work as well. Okay. Now, this is a general solution technique, graphical solution technique. Works for low dimensions. And we see that this even works for equations that are not linear. Okay, so we do this example to compare with what we see when we solve for linear equations. All right, here is a description of a system of linear equations, a general system of linear equations. Looks complicated. Let's break this down. Okay. First of all, we notice we have multiple equations. How many equations do we have? Well, you have to look at the index. All right. You can see over here the B1, first index is 1, second index is 2, going all the way down to the index M. So there are M equations here. Okay. Now, we also have in each equation several variables, x1 through xn. So we have n variables in these equations. Now, you may not like all these subscripts, but this is a good way of keeping track of multiple variables. If I called my different variables x, y, z, w, q, r, s, t, I would soon run out of letters. In this case, I always use x as my variable, and to distinguish between different variables, I use different subscripts. 
So here I have n variables, a lot of variables. It's a very compact notation. Okay. Now each one of these variables has a coefficient. Now, for instance, in the second equation, the variable x3 has coefficient a sub 2, 3. Okay. So all of these coefficients have two indices. The first coefficient in, in, indicates which equation it's in. The second, coefficient, the second index indicates which variable it's multiplying. Okay, so for instance here, amn is in the nth equation, and it's the coefficient of the nth variable. Okay, so very compact notation, a little bit complicated. You'll get used to it. Okay. All right, now, so what's a solution of a system of linear equations? What do we call by a solution? Well, it's going to be a set of specific numbers such that if you plug these numbers in for your variables, all of the equations work. Now, here he talks about complex numbers. At the beginning, we're not going to talk too much about complex numbers or complex solutions, but later on, we'll see that those are very important. Okay. Usually, if we have a, uh, a solution, we'll just write it this way. If we have three variables, x1, x2, and x3, and the plugging in of 12 minus 7 and 2 means all the equations are satisfied, we call our solution x1 equal 12, x2 equal minus 7, x3 equal 2. Okay? We'll see examples of that as we go along. So let's look at this example of a notation for a system of equations. So here we have this form here. You can see we have three equations, and we also have how many variables? Well, there are four variables. Some of the equations don't have all four. For instance, the first one doesn't have x3. Usually, when you write equations like this, you line them up so the variables are in the same column. But still, we can read off the coefficients for each variable in each equation. For instance, in the coefficient of the third variable in the second equation is what? Well, the third variable is x3, and the coefficient here is 1. So that means that a, 2, 3 should be equal to 1, and it is. Okay. Notice here, one of the variables is missing. Which one is it? Well, it's the third variable. Okay. So in fact, in the first equation, the third variable is missing. That means that a, 1, 3 should be equal to 0, and in fact, it is. Now, if you plug in x1 equal minus 2, x2 equal 4, x3 equal 2, x4 equal 1, it turns out that all of these equations are satisfied. Okay. It also turns out that there's another solution. Plug in x1 equal minus 12, x2 equals 11, x3 equals 1, x4 equals minus 3. So there's more than one set of numbers that works here. So we'd say that there's a, the solution set consists of more than one uh, element. Okay. Now, there are many different possibilities for solution sets. So let's see how this works out in these specific examples. And in these particular examples, since we're only looking at two variables, these are examples that we could graph in a plane. I'm not going to graph the first one, but uh, that's an interesting one to do, and you can read the description to verify your graph. I will graph the second one. See what that looks like. I've copied that here. 2x plus 3, 2x1 plus 3x2 equals 3. All right, so I'm going to want to have an x1 axis and an x2 axis instead of an x and y axis. Where's my mouse here? So get the lines going. So this will be my x2 axis, this will be my x1 axis. Okay. And 2x2 plus 3x2, 2x1 plus 3x2 equals 3. One way to get these lines is take x1 equal to 0 and see what x2 is. If x1 is equal to 0, that means that x2, you can work it out, would have to be equal to 1. On the other hand, if I took x2 equal to 0, then x1 would be equal to 3 halves.
Okay, so that gives me two points on the line. And maybe you remember that if you have two points on a line, you have the entire line. So two points on this first line are 0, 1, which is here, say. And the other one is uh, 3 halves 0. So this is 1. So 3, if this is, that's about 1 there. So 3 halves would be about here. So that's where my first line is. My first line looks something like this. It goes through these two points. Okay, so that's my first line. Okay. Let's try the second line. Well, if for the second one, if I put x1 equal to 0, what do I get for, the third, for, for x2? x1 is 0, x2 is going to be 6 times x2 equals 6. That means x2 equals 1. Okay, and then for the second one, if I set x2 equal to 0, then I'm going to get x1 is equal to 3 halves. Uh-oh. We have the very same two points. In fact, these two equations designate the very same line. So in any point on one line is also a point on the other line. What that means is that any point on this common line is a solution for both of these. So for instance, 0, 1 is a solution for the system. Uh, uh, I'm, yes, and then uh, uh, 3 halves 0 is also going to be a solution for the system. This point is 0, 1. This is 3 halves 0. And any number of the other solutions. If I plugged in x1 equal to 1, I could solve for x2, and that would also be a solution. Okay. Now here's another uh, case that I invite you to look at. In this case, there's actually no solutions for the system. All right, now here we're going to talk about the beginnings of a very good and fruitful strategy for solving linear equations. So this definition of equivalent system says two systems of linear equations are equivalent if their solution sets are equal. That doesn't mean the two systems are equal, it just means the solution sets are equal. The two systems could look very different. So the idea that we're going to be using in this class and a lot through this class is take a complicated system and massage it into a much simpler looking system that has the same solution set. Okay. And one way that we're going to change solutions, uh, change uh, uh, systems of equations into, other, into equivalent systems is to use what's known as equation operations. And here are the three standard equation operations that are used. First of all, you can swap two equations in the list of equations. If you think about, for instance, this example here, if I had written the second equation first, that wouldn't change the situation at all. Okay? It doesn't matter what order you write the equations in. So no matter how you list your equations, you can reorder them and not change the solution set. Another thing that you can do is multiply each term of an equation by a non-zero quantity. I'm sure you've done that in abstract algebra. In fact, you notice that this second equation can be obtained from the first equation by multiplying every term by 2. Okay? So if we had just started with the first equation and multiplied every term by 2, that giving us the second equation, we're not changing the solution set. So that's another way of changing equations without changing their solution set. Okay. This one's the most complicated one. Multiply each term of one equation by some quantity and add these terms to a second equation on both sides of the equality. Leave the first equation the same after this operation, but replace the second equation by the new one. Okay. We'll have to see some examples of this to see how this works. But these are actually the three equation operations that are used to transform one system of equations into an equivalent system of equation. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to present a general technique for simplifying systems of equations. And in order to show things in general in mathematics, you, do, you create things called theorems. And theorems are uh, mathematical statements that have proofs. So here's a short introduction to what a proof is. Now, certainly proofs are a very difficult part of higher mathematics, so we'll try to introduce you to these in a very gentle way. Uh, so, usually a theorem or mathematical statement has the following form. 
If something is true, then something else is true. Okay. The, the first part, the if part, is called the hypothesis, and the conclusion is called the conclusion. I mean, the then part is called the conclusion. Okay. Pretty much any mathematical theorem that you have can be written in this form. If one set of conditions is holds, then a conclusion follows. Okay. And we'll see that in the theorem that we're about to talk about. Okay. So here's the theorem that, that's going to be very key in the first part of this class. It says, if we apply one of the three equation operations above, remember we had these three equation operations, if we apply any one of these operations to a system of linear equations, then the original system and the transform system are equivalent. In other words, they have the same solution set. I'm actually going to skip the proof here, but I do want you to get the concept that this is a very fundamental uh, tool that we can take one system of linear equations and do these operations in a convenient way and get another system of so linear equations that has the same solution set. Okay, here's one example. Uh, and these are types of algebraic operations you may have seen before. Let's start with this complicated look looking system of linear equations. The first equation operation we apply to this is multiply the first equation, the first equation here by minus one and add it to the second equation. Multiply the first equation by minus one, add it to the second equation. If we do that, we can add coefficient by coefficient. So remember what we're trying to do, take the first equation, multiply by minus one, add to the second equation. And what you do is you replace the second equation with your result. So if you look at this system of equations, the first equation has not changed, the last equation has not changed, the second equation is replaced by uh, minus one times the first equation times the second equation. So let's follow this through. Minus one times x1 is minus x1. If I add that to x1, that's going to give me 0, so that'll be 0x1. Minus 1 times 2x2 is minus 2x2. Add to 3x2 gives me 1x2. Minus 1 times 2x3 gives me minus 2x3. Add to 3x3 gives me x3. Minus 1 times 4 gives me minus 4. Add to 5 gives me 1. And notice I've done this variable by variable. This is a convenient way of doing it. In this way, I don't have to write anything down. I can just check variable by variable that it works. Okay. Now, notice one thing here is we have this nice zero here, and that's going to be useful later on. Okay. Let's do another uh, equation operation, which is similar. I'm going to take this system of equations, take minus 2 times the first equation, and add to equation 3. So the first two equations remain the same. The third equation changes. What's the new third equation? Well, I'm going to take minus 2 times this first equation and add it to the third equation. Right? So we'll do that variable by variable again. Minus 2 times x1 plus 2 times x1 gives me 0 times x1. All right, let's continue. Let's look at the second variable. Minus 2 times this term, 2x2. Add to the second term in the last equation, 6x2. So minus 2 times 2x2 gives me minus 4x2. Plus 6x2 is going to give me 2x2 altogether. That's the result right here. OK. Next is to take minus 2 times this term. So minus 2 times 2 is minus 4. I'm going to add to this 5x3 term. That's going to give me a 1x3, which is correct down here. Minus 2 times the last term here is minus, minus 8. Plus 6 is going to give me minus 2, which is correct. Right, now notice here I have two nice zeros, which I'm going to be using later. Okay. 
The choice of these operations, we'll see later how they're chosen. But here, we'll just follow through the operation. Okay? Here's the next operation. Take minus 2 times the second equation and add to the third equation. So we're going to be dealing with these two equations here, the second and the third equation. So just ignore the first equation. first equation carries down identically. All right. And since we're adding to equation 3, the second equation as well. The second equation here is the same as the second equation here. It's the third equation that's going to change. Take minus 2 times the second equation and add to the third equation. Okay, So we're looking at these two equations. Let's go variable by variable. Minus 2 times 0x1 is again 0x1. Add that to 0x1 still gives me 0x1. So that's going to give me the 0x1 in this place. That's correct. Minus 2 times this second variable here, minus 2 times x2 is going to be minus 2x2, plus the third equation, which is 2x2. It's going to give me minus 2 plus 2, or 0, gives me another 0 right here. Minus 2 times the third term gives me minus 2x3, plus x3 gives me minus x3 altogether. That's the same as the term. Minus 2 times 1 gives me minus 2. And I add to equation 3, which is minus 2. That's going to give me minus 2 minus 2 is minus 4. Okay. All right, very good. So now we have another system of equations. Lots of nice zeros here. The last thing we're going to do is multiply the last equation in this system by minus 1. So it's alpha equals minus 1 times equation 3. The first two equations remain the same. You can see this equation here has not changed in this system. The second equation has not changed. The third equation, I'm going to multiply every coefficient by minus 1. If I multiply 0 by minus 1, nothing changes. I still have 0. If I multiply 0 by minus 1, I still have 0. Nothing changes. If I multiply minus 1 by minus 1, I get plus 1. I have this result. If I multiply minus 4 by minus 1, I get plus 4. Okay, and I have a new system of equations. All right, so in order to see clearly what's going on, let's get rid of the zeros because they're not necessary. And you can see when you write down this system that x3 equals 4 just pops out. Once you have x3 equals 4, you can substitute into the previous equation. That would give me x2 plus x4, oh, I'm sorry, x2 plus 4 equals 1. If you take the 4 to the other side, that becomes x2 equals minus 3. So now I have x3 and x2. I can plug x3 and x2 into the first equation. So uh, remember, x2 is minus 3. So I have x1 plus 2 times minus 3 gives me minus 6. Plus 2 times x3, remember x3 is 4, so that's 8. So I have minus 6 plus 8, that gives me 2. So I have x1 plus 2 equals 4. Okay, That gives me x1 equal to 2. So I have used this equation to find x1, x2, and x3. And similarly, we can show that these are the only possible solutions. This equation shows that x3 must be 4. If x3 must be 4, then from the second equation we get x2 must be minus 3. And then from that we get x1 must be 2. Okay, so there's one example. Another example. Okay. You can follow through these operations. Uh, uh, see if you can follow through by yourself. We're doing the very same thing here. Notice that in this first operation, you're only going to be changing equation to and go variable by variable. Right? It's going to this operation is going to involve the first two equations here. So you're going to take minus 1 times for equation 1, add to equation 2. If I took the first variable, for instance, I'd have minus 1 times x1 plus x1. That's going to give me 0x1. And I substitute that in to the second equation here. You work your way across and get all of these changes. Okay. And you do the same thing going down. Eventually, you end up with a system of equations of similar form as before. 
Uh, here you've got 0 equals 0. That's always true, no matter what values of x2, x1, x2, x3, x4 you put in. Okay. All right. Now, uh, here we have a lot of arbitrary choices. I could choose x3 and x4 to be anything at all and get a value for x2. And I could choose, I'd use that same value of x3 and x4 to get a value for x1. Okay, so uh, in this case, no matter what x3 or x4 I put in, I can always find x1 and x2 that work. So in this case, we have an infinite solution set. In this case, he's saying uh, we can choose x3 as a. We let a, the variable a, denote the choice of x3. And we let the variable b denote the choice of x4. And if I choose x3 as a and x4 as b, I can use these two equations here to find out what x2 and x1 must be. For example, if x3 is b, if x3 is a and x4 is b, I plug a in for x3 and b in for x4. Notice the similarity between this equation and this equation. We've just plugged in, replaced the x3 with a, and we've replaced the x4 with b. In that case, we have an expression for x1 in terms of a and b. Similarly, we can plug in a and b in for x3 and x4. In the second equation, I have x2 minus a plus 2b equals 4. That's going to give me an expression for x2. Okay. So in general, if I want the solution set, I want to write down all possible values of x1, x2, x3, x4. If x3 is b, x4, x3 is a, x4 is b, I get this result for x1, this result for x2. This is a general solution. Now here he said a is a complex number, b is a complex number. Don't worry about that right now. We can think about a and b as real numbers. Okay. All right, now the last thing in this section, it talks about SAGE. You can go to the web page and type in, according to the tutorial, actually do these things, and evaluate. And the computer will do, it's like an online calculator, only with many more capabilities. So I'd like you to work through this SAGE tutorial on your own. And then we have exercises, and that's the end of this section.